No, We're Sherry. Live, so I'm sorry, Terry, go ahead. Um, you're all ready to start. Okay. Um, if you, you all want to um, mute your mics, that might be helpful as we our presenter begins, but I wanted to welcome everybody. Um, we have another great program with the collaboration of the BCTV and the Berwick Public Library. And tonight's speaker is Dr. Michael Schroeder, and he is going to present on Charles Reed during the Civil War and the great rebels in Portland Harbor. Um, Dr. Schroeder comes to us as a longtime volunteer since he retired from the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. And he was employed there as a health physicist. He is a longtime member of the Civil War Roundtable of New Hampshire. And he has his BS from Illinois Institute of Technology, an MS from the University of Illinois, and a PhD from the University of Maine, all in physics. Dr. Schroeder is also a veteran, having served on active duty with the U.S. Navy from 1979 to 1983. He now resides in Berwick, and we're lucky enough to have had him come on board as a volunteer at the Berwick Public Library and a board member of the Berwick Library Association. So thank you, Dr. Schroeder, and I am looking forward to this program, and please take it away. Okay. Um First of all, uh, uh, time for a little humor because it'll get a little bleak later, but I'm going to try to keep this to about an hour and uh, say 30 minutes, maybe a little longer than that. Uh, this is a, a little thing I showed everybody as a warning, and it says that eventually everyone has come to dread my lectures over all of the of forms of punishment. So if you've seen, you haven't seen me before, this is, this is your initial um, uh, prop. Uh, uh, dose. Okay, so why Charles Reed? Why are we going to talk about Charles Reed here? Well, uh, why not one of the other thousands of you know uh, junior officers, junior naval officers uh, in during the war? Uh, clearly, the reason is, as the uh, title gives away, is that he intersects with uh, uh, some of our local history. Uh, kind of an interesting, uh, uh, you know, kind of a unique little bit of history here. That a lot of uh, a lot of the uh, uh, natives don't know about, so we're going to learn about that. Uh, but also, I, I picked this guy because his career, at least the first two years of it in the, in the war, is fought on the Mississippi River, and we're going to follow him. And by doing so, okay, we're going to learn a lot about uh, that particular campaign, the the, the fight in the West. Uh, most uh, Civil War um, uh, now. No, I should say novels, but most Civil War material tends to give short shrift to uh, the West. Uh, they may mention Vicksburg and a few other things, but it tends to center on the East and, and the and the, the on to Richmond campaigns and stuff like that. Well, the war was probably, at least in my opinion, was actually won in the West. And uh, consequently, it's nice to know something about it. So we'll, with that, we'll, we'll move on to the man himself, his pre-war career. And here he is. Uh, Charles Reed, this, is, this picture is probably a, a picture of him at the Naval Academy. Notice the, uh, the, the flashy uh, uh, lapel pins he's wearing. Or it's, it's actually color devices. I mean, it's, it's literally a, a, an anchor. So this is probably him in, in his, in his, um, his uh, midshipman's uniform. I mean, you, you see that they, uh, they really had a sense of style. I mean, he's got that little, uh, that nice little hairdo. I'm, I'm the, the, uh, the mustache, not so much, but, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's a typical 19th century guy. He was born in May 1840 at Ceteria, Mississippi, uh, the eldest of five kids. Uh, Ceteria is still in, ex in existence. Uh, it is the smallest incorporated um, uh, municipality in Mississippi with just 70 people left in it. Um, and uh, he, he, uh, he was living essentially on a farm. Uh, his father left in 1849 uh, to join the California Gold Rush. He's a 49er. Uh, he uh, earned the family some kind of, you know, uh, a fortune. But he dies uh, almost just about a year after he left, leaving uh, Charles here as the man of the family. Uh, consequently, 
uh, his, the family, the, the mother uh, sold the farm and they moved to Jackson, Mississippi to be near the mother's relatives, especially uh, one of her brothers who would sort of serve as a, uh, as a uh, foster father to, uh, to Charles. Uh, as a teen, he wrote for local newspapers and he was kind of a rambunctious lad. Uh, he probably looked a little too deeply into a few things. He stirred up a bit of trouble, so much so that he uh, felt the need to run away and so try to sign up as a crewman on a merchant ship in, uh, in New Orleans. His, um, his family, however, found him. They, they, they chased him down, found him, got him, uh, got him out of his, um, his uh, contract with the ship and uh, eventually brought him home. And, and the, the uncle is supposedly said that, you know, this kid maybe needs just a wee bit discipline. You know, he's a smart kid, but he needs some discipline. So they tried to get him into apparently either a college prep or a, a, an actual uh, college. Uh, he passed his entrance exams for the United States Naval Academy. And he reported there in uh, July of 1856 at the tender age of 16. Now I'll ask you this, what were all you doing at age 16? This, this guy is going off to what is essentially a college, okay, would, would have been considered a college at the time. I mean, at 16, I was, I think, a sophomore in, in high school. Uh, and he's going essentially uh, as part of uh, joining a, a, an officer candidate school kind of, 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 of setup. So how many of you were in an officer candidate school when you're 16 years old? Not me. I didn't get there until I was 23, okay? Uh, it's, it just shows you that we tend to think of these people being just like us, but there, there's a lot of differences there. There was a completely different world. You would think of sending a 16-year-old off to college, off for a career, essentially. I mean, uh, it just seems to me that's 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 important thing to remember. And we're going to see even more of these kind of, um, you know, things where we see that the things aren't the way they we they are now. Okay, he, he goes to the parts of the Naval Academy. And he's still kind of, you know, rambunctious. Uh, he, he produces a less than illustrious record. He racks up a near record number of demerits for fighting, profanity, failure to pass room inspection, and other infractions. So you can see right here, he's going to be a great naval officer. He's combative. He swears like a sailor. Okay. And he's a slob. Okay. And, and, and that's, those are important aspects of being a, a, a naval officer, right? Uh, he was described by a fellow student as not very brilliant, one of those wiry, energetic fellows who would attempt anything but study. Now, that wasn't me. I don't know some of you, but I mean, but yeah, he was, he clearly had, you know, what he, he, he was interested in, he did well in, what he wasn't interested in, he kind of, you know, just passed. His worst subject was French, a language he mastered, uh, he mastered only the pronunciation of one word, save, to know. And as a result, he got uh, nicknamed by his fellow cadets as Savi. Okay, um, he received those lo low marks in theory of naval gunnery. He was fourth from the bottom. However, and importantly for, for this story, he turns out to have a real natural aptitude for actually, you know, manning and using the guns. He he, he was really good at it, and his instructors encouraged him to get good at it because, let's face it. Uh, if you're going to go into the Navy, you're going to be a naval officer in the 19th century. It's, if you're going to get into a fight, it's going to involve gunnery. In any case, in June 1960, he graduates last in a class of 25 students. So he's, uh, you know, it's, it's, looks, it's looking good for him, you know, 20, 25 out of 25. Um, so let's take a look at what he did. Uh, he, uh, following graduation, he was assigned to the USS Powhatan. Uh, then part of the USN squadron in Gulf of Mexico. Let's take a quick look at the Powhatan. Uh, it's a, there's a lot of different ship designs, a lot of different uh, uh, motive uh, uh, methods, a lot of different uh, armament. But, <clears throat> so let's take a look at this. It's an inter it's interesting to see the vet, you know the different styles and different uh, shapes. This is an older ship. It was laid down in 1847. And what you see here is it's a double side wheeler. You can see the side wheel right here. Uh, 3,800 tons, roughly, 276 feet long, 45 wide. It draws 21 feet of water. 
So it's not coming up the, the river to Berwick anytime any soon. Okay. Uh, two inclined direct acting engines. It's got four boilers and it's got a whopping 1100 horsepower. Now, does anybody out there know by any chance uh, what the uh, typical horsepower is of, uh, of one of some of these big trucks that are always trying to run you off the road now? You know, like an F-350? I guess, okay, an F-350 has about 475 horsepower. So this two, this ship has about the equivalent, a little over, oh, nice cat, a little over uh, two um, F-350s in the, is, is for motive power. Unfortunately, an F-350 weighs about, what, two and a half tons, three tons? This thing weighs 3,800 tons. Okay, so uh, these, these ships were, by today's standards, grossly underpowered. These, these plants, uh, the, these uh, uh, engineering plants, were, they were heavy and they were extremely inefficient. They, you can tell it's heavy because the, the ship is displacing 21 feet of water. That's a lot of water. Anyway, it's got about 300 people on it. I'll end the show here. Okay, so 1860 was not exactly the best time uh, to uh, be entering a new career or a military career because uh, it was, a, it was a, a election year. And 6 November 1860, Lincoln is elected the 16th president of the United States. Now, we usually think of this as, as being, wow, that's, that's great. But you, uh, at the time, uh, it wasn't greeted the same way by a lot of people. No ballots were cast for him in 10 of the 15 southern states. Of the 30, 10 of the 33 total states, he got not a single vote. It's hard to understand or get a feel for that. What, how, did they, how did he get elected? Well, let's take a look here. Here's the actual election map. And you see, first of all, unlike the ones you see today, there's more than two colors. Okay, there's the red for the Republicans. And then there's three other colors here. There's blue for Stephen Douglas, who is a Northern Democrat. Okay, there's green for uh, John C. Breckinridge, who is a Southern Democrat. Okay, and there's orange for John Bell, who is a constitutional unionist. Okay. Uh, Slavery had begun to eat away at the country at, during and after the Mexican War. Uh, there, the, um, the Democratic Party had always been a strong, um, uh, had strong uh, discipline. Uh, if you didn't follow the party rules, the party uh, platform, you would get kicked out. You wouldn't get any patronage. Uh, there was a party that was essentially uh, very conservative. We call it conservative today. It was about minimal government. OK, and as far as slavery went, it would believe that slavery should be left alone uh, in the South and had a right to expand into the territories. Uh, the other party at, at, the, at the, that time uh, was uh, the Whig Party. Now, the Whigs were more of a, 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 a we'd almost call it a progressive party now. They were pro internal improvements. They wanted a national bank. They wanted all these good things. And they didn't but they didn't have very good party discipline, and there was no, no official Whig stand on uh, slavery. So when the crisis comes after, this, after the uh, Mexican War, when uh, the slavery can now begin to expand into these territories, uh, this, the Whig party just falls apart, and the members of the Whigs, the Northern Whigs go to the Republican Party, which is formed, and the Southern Whigs go to the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party had a little trouble also. Uh, the Southern Democrats were for uh, very, uh, vo uh, pers um, wa were very pro expansion of slavery into the territories. Uh, Northerners, however, were not so, uh, not so uh, keen on that idea. But, and went to, uh, since their, their constituents were, didn't really like the idea of the expansion of slavery, they would, they would talk about what they called popular sovereignty, which was actually a day of Stephen Douglas, by the way. Uh, the idea uh, being that uh, the, uh, the uh, territories could figure out whether they wanted slavery before they entered the Union. And since most of the immigrants were going to be coming from the North anyway, they didn't really expect very many, if any, slave states to be created. This was, was, this dis this was different from what the uh, Southern, wanted, uh, Southern Democrats wanted. So when the time came for the 1860 uh, convention, uh, this, the uh, Democrats split. 
along uh, sectional lines. Uh, Douglas had actually been the supposed uh, candidate. Uh, again, it was a very disciplined party, and every statesman, you know, in the party had his, his little block. Uh, Buchanan had just been president. He had uh, his four years. He was from Pennsylvania. Then it was going to be the Midwest turn. And Stephen Douglas, uh, who was, if you remember, is part of the Stephen, the du Lincoln Douglas debates, uh, will, uh, okay, is, is, is the, the uh, presumed candidate. But when it comes time, the uh, Southern states walk out of the uh, convention and they nominate uh, uh, John C. Breckinridge, who was at the time the vice president of the United States. Now, this guy will have a wild career after he's he's only been vice president. OK, but as after he after he is out of office, he will become a senator from Kentucky and then he will leave in the union. OK, in the U.S. Congress and then he'll leave and he'll go to the south. He'll become a major general in the Confederate Army. And by the end of the war, he'll be the Confederate secretary of war. So you can see where his his lot his feelings lie. Uh, Bell is uh, a group of people who are trying to maintain sanity, uh, and uh, uh, you know, let's just all let's get along and obey the Constitution. Well, the the the, part, the elections held uh, enough votes gets uh, siphoned off up north, but by two different Democratic uh, 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 candidates that Lincoln wins the entire North and the uh, uh, Oregon and California. Uh, Breckenridge wins the entire South uh, and uh, Stephen Douglas only gets one state. He gets uh, Missouri and Bell gets these. And here's, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Here's the actual votes. Uh, Lincoln got 40% of the vote, made president of the United States because he took 18 states and got 180 electoral votes. He got 1.9 roughly million votes. The next closest is Stephen Douglas here. The guy, he takes a lot of votes from the North too. He gets 1.4 million votes, okay? And, but he only wins one state. Between Lincoln and, and, and Douglas, they've got 70% of the total popular vote. Two boys from Illinois, okay? Just like yourself. I'm a, I'm a Illinois, I'm your boy, okay? Uh, the next is uh, St uh, John Breckenridge. He only gets about 850,000 votes. 11, he gets 72 electoral votes. And John Bell with the least, uh, only gets over about 600,000 votes. Uh, he, he only gets uh, three electoral votes, uh, um, I should say. He gets 39 electoral votes. Uh, these three candidates, if they had, had just a united under one candidate, they had more than enough votes to uh, force uh, Lincoln uh, uh, to lose, okay? But the Southern states see this as an affront. Lincoln is a... Uh, essentially, the, and his party are they do not want the slavery to expand into the into the into the territories, and they'll have none of it. I mean, they, they, uh, uh, people called the fire eaters had been you know raising this, the 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 uh, the uh, been, uh, you know waving a red flag for years, saying that the, the Lincoln's if the if the Republicans ever uh, won the election, they were just going to uh, get rid of slavery. And there, they, after he does win. It's in just in time for Christmas, 20th December, uh, South Carolina secedes from the Union. And immediately, six other states go all, a, almost, you know, bang, bang, bang. Mississippi, 9 January, Florida, 10. Alabama, 11 January. Georgia, the 19th. Louisiana, the 26th January. And Texas, the 1st of February. But after that, nobody else leaves. Leave the Union. By the way, our boy, Reed, he's from Mississippi. He immediately resigns his commission in the U.S. Navy. Okay, so whatever. By 8 February 61, a provisional Confederate government is established in Montgomery, Alabama. Now they're trying to get more states to enter this Confederacy. Uh, they want the Upper South, which, if we looked over here, would be these states here. It'd be like Arkansas, uh, uh, Tennessee, maybe Kentucky, uh, Virginia, which by Today's eyes looks a little bit odd. North Carolina, Maryland. They want to get these states to come into the into the uh, Union. I mean, into the Confederacy because there's so few people, uh, su such a low population, so little industry in what did secede. So they 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 know that uh, the these states have actually uh, referendums, 
And in, in the case of Virginia and Tennessee, they, they actually vote on uh, uh, secession and both of them turn it down at, by wide margins. Uh, so it's looking good, but they, the, the, the Southerners think, well, we got to somehow uh, show, have Lincoln show what a horrible creature he is. You know, just he's, he's, he's ready to do something odd. So what they, what they do is they force the issue by uh, trying to force the uh, small garrison of the Union forts, the, the national forts in Charleston Harbor. Uh, eventually on 12 April, they fire on those forts. 13 April, they, 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 the, the soldiers are well, when they're surrendered. Uh, and this leaves Lincoln in kind of a bind. He's been trying desperately to keep the, as much of the Union together as he can. And he's been trying to tempt the Southerners back in by showing the Southerners who have seceded back in, by showing them that, you know, he's a pretty reasonable guy. He actually uh, put, uh, uh, put his stamp of approval on a proposed 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution. Now, it's not the one we usually think of. This 13th Amendment was going to, uh, was going to actually uh, just actually put in, in words what everybody knew, which is that the, the federal government had, could not and should not interfere with the internal dynamics of, of state uh, of, uh, systems. So in other words, what it would have done what it was it would have shown that the federal government had no role in, in slavery, that it could neither prevent it nor encourage it to, to go anywhere. Uh, so, you know, this is, you know, they're, they're trying, but with this firing on the Fort Sumter, he's, he doesn't know what to, uh, he says there's two ways he can go. If he doesn't do anything, uh, the people in the North who are now enraged will cool off and this this whole thing will, you know, the, 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 the Confederacy will probably be assured independence. But if he does, he thinks the Northern, the, the Upper South might not react well. But in any case, he decides he's going to go to war. He issues a proclamation, proclamation for 7,500, 75,000 volunteers for a period of 90 days, which is, a, is, is laughably uh, small. Uh, it will take uh, over four years, which is like 1,450 days, to, to, to end the war. Uh, it will take uh, 2.5 million men under arms at one time or another, both in the Union and the Confederacy, to fight this thing out. So he's off by at least a factor of 15 to 20, both in the time it's going to take and the, uh, the number of people it's going to take. But that uh, enrages, that proclamation enrages the South. The Upper South says, look, the, the Lower South had all the right in the world to secede, and we're not going to help you uh, fight it off, fight them and bring them back in. And Virginia, Arkansas, North Carolina, and Tennessee succeed, secede. Okay. And by the summer of 1861, Charles Reed gets a commission as lieutenant in the Confederate States Navy, and he's assigned to the Mississippi Squadron. So let's take a look at his service on the Mississippi. Okay, the primary goal of forces in the CS forces in the West was defensive. It was to protect the Confederate heartland. Let's take a look at that. Okay, this is the uh, Confederate and uh, upper, you know, part of the Midwest uh, that uh, runs along the Mississippi Valley. You take if you take a look at this, the first thing you're going to notice, and maybe you can't read it as well as I can, but there's this long black line that comes down from the north and ends up going through New Orleans and out to sea, okay? That's the Mississippi River. Uh, the Confederates were pretty sure that this was going to be the route by which the Northerners would come down. It's, 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 a, it's being used at this point in time to send about 80% of the export goods from the Midwest out to the, out to the rest of the world. Only 20% is going uh, east, west to east on railroads. Uh, and uh, so this, this uh, to, to the southern mind is clearly okay. The um, uh, the uh, preferred uh, uh, route for an invasion. It also, if you look at where the boundary for the Confederacy is, it's this silly little line here. This is the northern boundary for the Confederacy, and that if you look at it, you say, "Geez, that doesn't look very defensible." Okay, and it uh, it isn't. Uh, the Confederacy badly wants. Uh, Kentucky and Missouri, but very surely Kentucky, to come into the into into the into the uh, Confederacy. And the reason for that is, 
then the northern part of the Confederacy would be the Ohio River, which is quite defensible. And uh, there was, people are already thinking about things like that. OK, uh, let's close this. OK, but again, the major the major thought of the Confederacy is they're going to get invaded from the north. That's correct. They think the route is going to be the Mississippi River. It isn't. And that the, the eventual goal of all this will be to capture New Orleans. The New Orleans at that time is a, is a really a big city uh, about in terms then. Total population was about 168,000. Uh, compar comparison, Boston at that time had about 177,000 people. Uh, so it's a relatively large town. The makeup is, is poly it's a very polyglot uh, uh, town. Uh, there's 2,400, 24,000 blacks but half of which are uh, free. Uh, there's 64, unlike most Southern towns, there's actually 64,000 uh, foreigners of which 24,000 are Irish. Now I mentioned that for one reason, uh, because it's, it's an interesting fact and a lot of people don't know this, but at the time of the United States Civil War, uh, one out of five uh, of, of the individuals who had been born in Ireland lived in the United States. Okay, the uh, Irish potato famine drew, uh, drove over 20% of the population out of Ireland and mostly to the United States. So that's all, uh, just a little thing, okay? Uh, you get a little picture here of how big the Conf that city was. It was, again, it was 170,000 people. And the nearest, uh, next five largest Southern towns, uh, they're nowhere near. They're a factor of three or four smaller. Total of those five uh, 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 cities, is less than the, than the population of New Orleans. And what this shows you is just how rural and non-urban the South was. These are, number 22 is not very high up on the pecking order, and that's your second largest city, okay? And there's a lot going on there. Uh, it was a bit, New Orleans was the, se the second busiest port in the US. Uh, it was one of the busiest ports in the world, 33 different uh, shipping lines, port receipts of 185 million. It's, it's let's just say, the, the uh, New Orleans had all the industry, banking, you know, and uh, that uh, the rest of the South did not have. It would have, this would be a very tempting target. Okay, so let's take a look at what the South did for defense. Okay, here again, here's your Northern frontier. Okay, uh, initially Kentucky remained neutral. It was kind of an odd thing. The uh, governor wanted to join the Confederacy, the uh, state legislature, uh, was pro-union, and so they, they remained neutral. The Confederacy really wanted to get up here, not only because of the Ohio River, but because there is a set of bluffs that run along uh, the uh, uh, Mississippi River here. They start out up here in Kentucky. They contact the river here between Columbus and then leave, and they come back in to, to the river here near Memphis. And then it leaves again, it comes back in near Virginia, runs down the river all the way to like Baton Rouge, and then out again. And putting fortifications on these bluffs is the way to go. And first of all, it's nice, high and dry. And, uh, and uh, you can drop your artillery shells on the enemy very easily. So it, this is going to, the Confederacy wants that real bad. They want it so badly that when it becomes obvious to them, that the uh, Kentucky is never going to enter the Confederacy. They they invade the Kentucky, saying that they're trying to protect them from uh, the Yankees. Okay, and they managed to grab uh, Columbus uh, here, where there is a three. The, the bluffs are actually about 300 feet above the Mississippi River. Okay, uh, and uh, they will eventually put about 200 guns here to seal off this, at least at the start. The, uh, uh, the Mississippi River. Now, just 17 miles up river is the town of Cairo, Illinois. It's not Cairo, it's Cairo, okay? And uh, that is uh, the closest uh, the, uh, the Confederacy ever got to my hometown. I, I, as a kid, was real interested in the Civil War. I never realized Confederate had armies uh, as fortresses only 17 miles from Illinois. But anyway, they, 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 they rush up into Kentucky and they start building a, uh, a set of fortifications here at Columbus. They will build fortifications on the uh, Tennessee River here at Fort Henry, the Col Columberland River at Fort Donaldson, and their line will run here from through these two forts 
and up into middle middle of Kentucky. Okay, but this is gonna the Columbus here is gonna be the knee of their uh, their their uh, uh, of their defenses because again. The Yankees are coming down the, the, the Mississippi River, so they're going to put defense in depth on the Mississippi. They'll build fortifications here at the New Madrid Island Number 10 area. It's called the Madrid Bend. And then just above Memphis, from Fort Pillow on down to Memphis, they'll build sets of, of, of fortifications. They would build forts down here at Vicksburg, but they've run out of men, equipment, and uh, uh, money, so to speak. Uh, Note, defense on depth here, no defense in depth here. You've got just a single line of, and this will be their, their downfall. Anyway, so let's go like this. Okay, here's okay, so Mississippi. South of the, the New Orleans, they defend the river uh, by use of four forts. Here is a map of New Orleans. The light area, the white areas here are the areas that are actually relatively dry. The rest of this area down here is very marshy, very swampy, and you can only really, you know, live without uh, fear of being flooded out occasionally in these, these white areas. There's New Orleans right on the river, okay? It's about 120 miles from the, um, from the Gulf of Mexico, and about 80 miles down river, there's a set of forts, Fort St. Philip and Fort Jackson, one on either side of the river, and those are the major the major blockage of the Mississippi River on the south side. Fort St. Philip was an old uh, Spanish fort, okay? It, it, uh, that's the fort uh, the United States got when it, it bought this area with the Louisiana, Louisiana Purchase, and it will be the fort that Jackson will use to, uh, or part of the defenses of New Orleans when the British come in 1815. Fort Jackson, named after, yes, you guessed it, uh, Andrew Jackson, is relatively new, but it's, so there's two forts here. There's also another two forts up here, Fort Maycomb and Fort Pike, and they block the uh, passages into Lake Pontchartrain here. Okay, so that's the major, two major ways you could get to New Orleans, would either be up this river here or going through one of these passages and into Lake Pontchartrain. Okay, so they think they've got it made, plenty of fortifications. Okay, everything's good. Uh, in, now, at, the at this time, uh, it was well known, the Confederates realized it too, that fixed fortifications aren't the be all and end all. You need two things to support them. You need mobile armies, and those mobile armies were mostly up in Kentucky, okay? And you need uh, naval forces uh, to support the forts. And this was uh, uh, the CSN, would form a squadron on the Mississippi, which they would call the Mosquito Fleet. Now, you might think, well, you know, it's kind of like here in Maine, there's mosquitoes all over the place. Maybe people were swatting, you know, all these mosquitoes. And that's, no, it was because the ships that the, this, this, this squadron had were on the small side. They, you know, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the South did not have the ability uh, to build ships. Uh, they, 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 they did grab a lot of, uh, of stuff and tried to convert it into uh, naval vessels, but they were all relatively small. They weren't ocean going uh, ships. Uh, it's commanded by Com Commodore George Holland. And, and I, we're gonna show him just briefly because it's interesting to see what a typical naval career was like in the 19th century. Here he is, he's born 1799. He gets appointed to the midshipman at the tender age of 14. Now in 1814. Now you might say, well, you know, it's, it's kind of like uh, Reed there who is, goes off to college, goes to the Naval Academy at age 16. Well, let me tell you, there wasn't a Naval Academy until the 1840s. When you went off to become a midshipman, an officer candidate in, in the navies of the world at this time, you were going to the school of the ship, which means they were going to throw you on board a ship and think about this, with sailors. Now, would you, would you send your grandchildren off to, uh, you know, stay with sailors for the rest of their lives? No, okay, you might send them for a day, but you know, uh, th these kids are being sent off at this right, this time, uh, age to essentially go to an officer candidate school that's gonna last a decade, okay? And they're gonna be hanging around, like I say, with sailors. Now don't get me wrong, I love sailors, 
But I don't know whether, I, you know, an age 14 is a good time to be introduced to him. Uh, he is a, he becomes a POW, a POW almost immediately in the uh, uh, War of 1812. He gets promoted to lieutenant. He actually becomes a officer a mere 11 years after he entered the Navy. So he was in this, this midshipman state for 11 years. And of course, uh, promotion is very swift. Uh, a mere 16 years later, he gets his next promotion, the commander. Okay, he was remembered, he's remembered for having bombarded and destroyed the town of San Juan de Nicaragua, he, no, Nicaragua in 1854. Uh, so I don't, it's an a interesting thing, but it shows you what kind of stuff navies did back then. He gets promoted to captain in 1855 after another 14 years. Okay, so it's, you know, promotion is coming swift. Uh, you know, he's his third promotion here, and he's been in the Navy only, a, well, what, what, 40, 41 years? I mean, I was only in the Navy for 22 and a half years. I, I can't even imagine staying in for 41 years. Anyway, he just, the really interesting thing is, in 1861, he's been in the Navy, let's face it, you know, 47 years, he resigns his USN commission to go to this, go with his, his state. And it shows that, you know, uh, there was a, unlike us today, where we consider ourselves Americans first, uh, these people really did consider themselves to be Tennesseans or Kentuckians or Virginians or Massachusetts people uh, before they considered themselves to be Americans. This guy flushed 46 year career, uh, fascinating. Anyway. Lieutenant Reed is assigned to the Mosquito Fleet, and he's going to serve as the executive officer of the CSS McRae. Okay, now, my exec XO, or executive officer, is the second in command of the ship. So this is no small deal. And here's the McRae. Uh, kind of a sleek-looking little thing. It's bark rig, whatever. I'm not really that familiar with it. It's only 680 tons. Uh, it's got seven guns total, one nine-pounder. Nine-inch smoothbore, uh, two eight-inch smoothbores, uh, six uh, uh, thirty-two pounders, and a, a saluting battery, which doesn't really count. Okay, this is the only real warship in the Mosquito fleet. It's a former Mexican Navy steamer, the Marquis de la Habana. Uh, it uh, it's kind of interesting. Mexico at this time was having trouble of its uh, own uh, internally. Uh, lots of different factions fighting for control. And one part of the Navy broke away and, uh, and sailed the ships to Cuba and declared themselves to be the real Navy of Mexico. The other half, which considered itself to be the real Navy of Mexico, played a little ha-ha trick on them by going to the Royal Navy and the USN and saying, oh, by the way, these ships here that just broke away, uh, they're not in the, our Navy anymore. They're pirates. Seize them and, or destroy them at will. This ship was actually captured uh, in the Battle of Anton Lazardo by the USN in March 1860. Uh, it was obviously brought to the United States to be sold as a, in a prize court. And it was purchased by the, eventually by the Confederate States Navy on 17 March uh, 1861. So this is it. Now, this is not a big warship. This is on the small side, okay? It's only got nine guns. Let's remember that later here. It's, it's kind of interesting. But anyway, he's on that ship. Well, they, the uh, Navy is patrolling the, Missis the Confederate States Navy, patrolling the, the uh, Mississippi River. And again, they're thinking, hey, the, the, the fighting is going to come from the north. The Union is going to come from the north. But the first action they see is the result of somebody coming up to the south. It's called the Battle of the Head of Passes. Okay. Uh, August uh, 61, a person by the name of Captain William McKean is assigned as the commanding officer of the U.S. Black Squadron, squadron blockading the mouth of the Mississippi River. Let's take a quick look at that. Here's the mouth of the Mississippi River. And you see it's got this kind of pigeon shape. The, the, it comes down and it, it, it's got a main thing. And then it splits off into four different passes. So there's four ways to get into the Mississippi River. This one over here is ingeniously named the Southwest Pass probably because it's pointed to the Southwest. This is the South Pass, okay? Another brilliant, you know, very mysterious and brilliant name. Here's the Northeast Pass, this thing right here. And then there's the Pass La Outre. Anybody know what that is in, uh, in French, Outre? 
It's otter, apparently. So they got three of them named after directions, and one's named after the animals you find there. So there's four different passes there. Uh, so uh, the squadron is, is pressed for resources, as the entire United States Navy is. The Navy had about 40 active ships at the time that the war started. So they were kind of pressed. They were bu buying up anything they could, uh, reactivating other things, and trying to get out to blockade uh, ports. They desperately wanted to blockade the Mississippi. And it occurred to the Navy that if they could occupy the head of the passes, it would be much simpler than trying to uh, uh, blockade just single single uh, pass or all these passes. He wants to, the Navy would come up here and get here where all the pa all four passes come together and it would be much easier to blockade the river. They in fact thought that you know, if they could, Maybe they would try to, on some of this solid ground here, which is hashed in, they would actually try to build some little batteries or forts so that they could, you know, have some fixed uh, defenses to keep people both in and out of the uh, river as, as they pleased. Okay. So on 19 September, uh, the Navy sends up the Water Witch, USS Water Witch, a little shallow draft uh, paddle wheel boat, and they, they, cut, they bring along some uh, Army Corps of Engineer types. And they survey the path of the passes and they find, yep, there's a couple of places we could build some batteries. Uh, good idea to block off the, uh, the river. So on 5 August, October, uh, four, a, a squadron of four USN ships goes up to start getting this work done. And the head of the thing, the biggest ship in this group is the Richmond. We'll show this again. Here's another ship uh, type. Uh, again, notice mostly sails. You can always tell it's got a... a uh, you know, it's got it's got a steam engine, 700 tons. Again, draws about 17 and a half uh, feet of water, uh, 1100 horsepower, 9.5 knots. Again, not my standard. But if you look at the guns, this ship has 22 major guns.
makes sense. If you could sink the Richmond, half of the Union naval guns would be gone. And you know what? You'd be in kind of a fair fight. So this makes plan. The plan is once the Manassas is done that, it's going to set off a signal and the rest of the Navy is going to shove off the, um, the fire rafts. Here's a, a, a sit the situation. Here's the head of the passes. Okay. Here's the Richmond. If the Preble has been set up a little bit ahead of everything else. These guys are supposed to be on watch. I don't know what they're watching for. They've got no radar. Uh, they don't have night scopes. And the moon is set. So it must have been, I suspect, a wee bit black. Okay. Pretty dark. Uh, the Richmond's here. It's coaling from the Tooney. And you got the Frolic the war, and another large ship, the Vincennes. Here's the, the uh, Mosquito Fleet comes down. The fire rafts are being pushed by the bigger ships. And the Manassas comes down and heads for the Richmond. Okay. Neat, neat. You know, great stuff. Uh, and sure enough, the Manassas passes the Pete Preble. And the Preble doesn't know exactly what, it's, what it is. But they set up a warning light kind of belatedly that something's in the river. Manassas finds the Richmond and rams it. Uh, the results were on, let's just say, a little bit more disappointing from the Confederate side than you, from the Confederate side than you would think. There's only a minor flooding on the Richmond. Richmond doesn't even realize what's going on at first, but there's some flooding, but it's not really bad. Uh, the Manassas, however, uh, takes most of the damage. When it rams the ship, uh, apparently it was built so shoddily, the boilers weren't mounted very well, so they kind of get up out of their out of their uh, uh, mounts and you know get loose in the in the engineering spaces. So there's the engine there's there's steam leaks all over the place. Uh, the ship starts to lose power. They barely manage to back themselves out of the Richmond and go over. Let's see, they 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 manage to back out of the Richmond. And they go over to this bank here where they'll run aground to try to, you know, save the ship. And if they will. Okay. Like the other thing that's interesting is they notice, boy, that the ship doesn't feel right. Uh, it turns out the, the collision with the uh, Richmond not only dismounted their boilers, it snapped off their uh, ram. So they're ramless. They, they don't have a propulsion plant anymore. And... Uh, They've just got barely sufficient power to fight the river current. So the Manassas is out of the fight, but they do send their little signal, okay? And uh, the Confederates light off the uh, fire rafts. And this, this marvelously concentrates the attention of the Union skippers because they're all in wooden ships and they don't really want a collision with a, a fiery vessel, okay? Uh, Captain Pope orders the squadron to proceed down the pass, i.e. retreat. Uh, the Union squadron uh, fires at the fire rafts and at Manassas with little effect. Manassas only loses her smokestacks. Okay, the surrounding woods take much damage. Okay, uh, the Preble has to cut its anchor chain to get underway quickly enough to escape down the pass. Vincennes and Richmond run aground while traveling down the pass. And after uh, dawn, what's, the CS squadron will stand off at a, a respectful distance and shoot at these ships that have run aground. Uh, they don't have much of an effect. Vincennes and Richmond get themselves off the, uh, off the mud and retreat. So the Confederacy has won the battle. They, they've driven away the Union fleet. And here's a, uh, I love these, 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 these newspaper illustrations uh, from the time. Here is, um, Here's the, the river, here are the fire rafts, here's the Manassas sh uh, get, shoving the Richmond, attacking the Richmond. Okay, so what, what are the consequences from the U.S. Navy's point of view? Uh, strong fear for ironclad rams. This is the only time something like this is going to happen, and the Navy gets to be really leery of, of, of rams. Captain Pope, he retires for health reasons. Never a good sign. The entire action is judged a, to be a complete debacle. David Dixon, we'll talk about him in a bit, put this matter in any light you may. It's the most ridiculous affair that ever took place in the United States Navy. Uh, I don't think so. I, I've been involved in quite a few things in the Navy when I was in the Navy that were far more ridiculous than this. So uh, USN uh, uh, begins to believe the best way to bottle up New Orleans may not be to uh, try to just bottle it up, 
but maybe capture it. And so this is something in some ways almost a defeat for the Confederacy because the Navy starts thinking uh, along different lines. Defense of the Madrid Brit, uh, Bend, well, let's face it, the Navy, the Navy and the Army have been expecting a, a real attack to come from the North and it eventually does, okay? Uh, 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 a, a little known character by the name of Brigadier General Ulysses S. Grant will take a force down from Cairo, uh, Cairo down the uh, Tennessee River and will uh, capture Fort Henry. And his forces will then move across the river to Fort Donaldson uh, after about a week and they will capture that. And by golly, the entire Confederate position up north just disintegrates because there's no defense in depth there. The Tennessee River goes down all the way down to here. I mean, it goes far into the south. The Cumberland River goes like this, and they're immediately in trouble. The Confederates are immediately in trouble because their forces are mainly on the north side of the Cumberland River from Fort Donaldson on, and the Union Navy can now, now get in there and block their retreat. So they immediately start retreating, uh, running, going south. Uh, they had spent six months at Bowling Green doing nothing but digging trenches. And one of the Union officers who, who examined their work said, when did these people ever eat and sleep? They, they did nothing apparently for, for six months but dig trenches. Uh, it's just gone, the whole, that whole bit of work. This area over here, Columbus, the thing they, 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 uh, they sacrificed Kentucky for to put a fort there, it's now outflanked. There's no, there's no support. They, they, they can't get any support from anywhere else in the army because they, the, the Tennessee River is now blockaded. Uh, oh, for God's sakes, uh, hold on a second. There we go. Anyways. Any case, uh, the, the Confederacy ends up having to evacuate C Cairo, excuse me, not Cairo, Columbus, Kentucky. Here, uh, they only you take a look here, Bowling Green falls on 13 February, uh, Nashville on 25th. Columbus, Kentucky, again, the first line defense is gone by 4 March. They ended up waiting a while, as long as they could. So they had to get their 200 guns out of there. And worse yet, the Union Army of the Mississippi under Brigadier General Pope moves to envelop New Madrid, the second line of defense. And if we go back to this thing here, what's going to happen is he will, he will leave uh, from central Illinois, cross over the river, and march downstream to New Madrid here now, which... Uh, the Union Navy can now get down to the beginnings of this fortress area here. Okay. So let's take a look, quick look at the area of New Madrid. It's a nice U-shaped bend here. Okay. Notice island number 10 is heavily fortified here. Any ship coming down is got to slow down to get through this turn. The, the, the Mississippi goes from south to flowing north to going south again. There's heavy fortifications on this island and on the shores here that keep, uh, there's 70 or 80 guns there that are going to keep any fleet from coming down past it without going practically at point blank range for these fortifications. There are also fortifications over here at New Madrid. New Madrid is the site of the, or it's the epicenter of the famous 1815 uh, uh, earthquake, the worst earthquake in American history, caused the Mississippi River to run backwards for a while. Uh, they're, they're up here, there's also some guns here that if anything should get past this, they've also got uh, this. Now, my, uh, Pope is going to come down from here and he's going to try to uh, capture New Madrid to begin the, uh, the envelopment of this rest of this area. He, he, what he doesn't realize is, is the Mosquito Fleet has come up to protect this area because the Northerners are coming down. For, this is the big slur, uh, uh you know, surge down the Mississippi River. So they come up here. When Pope's people par, uh, pop out of the woods to begin enveloping and attack, attacking New Madrid, uh, the Mosquito Fleet may not have a lot of guns, but they're much bigger than anything these, these poor army guys do. And they, they, the, uh, the artillery fire forces them back into the woods. So Pope can't come to grips with the 20, he's got 18,000 men, but he can't come to grips with the 2,600 men that are in New Madrid. Uh, he, so he says, I've got to be able to drive these forces off. So later in the evening, he has his troops slip down here 
and they build earthworks here and at Point Pleasant, and they man them with our infantry, with our muskets, and of course, with light um, normal you know, field artillery. The next day, the, uh, the uh, mosquito fleet shows up, look, and they see that there are these forts, and these little forts, these little earthworks are shooting at them. Well, it turns out that a little six-pounder Napoleon doesn't, can't do much damage to a, a huge naval ship, and the, uh, the uh, mosquito fleet would like to sh shoot these people off, so they begin shooting back. The problem with that is, is these are earthworks, and the earthworks protect the artillery, so neither side can really force the other out. Okay, they're, they're, they can shoot at one another. The, uh, the, the infantry shooting musketry doesn't do much at all. And so this is, it, it, this is a, 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 a more or less a, a, a standoff here. The uh, infantry can't get to, to come to grips with New Madrid because the, uh, uh, the, the fleet is here shooting at them. And these, these, these forts here aren't, don't have the right kind of artillery to drive the ships away. Well, Pope will uh, ask for uh, and get his siege artillery by the 13th of March. There's suddenly very large guns in these forts. The day, dawn, day dawns, uh, same day, same old, same old, according to the, the, the mos mosquito fleet, but they begin to receive shells and fire from much larger guns. And this time, although they can't do any, they can't inflict any damage on the forts, the forts can inflict damage on the ships and the mosquito fleet is forced to retreat be below Point Pleasant. And it'll take about three weeks, but the uh, uh, this uh, the Union Army will eventually uh, capture Island Number 10 in these fortifications. And I've got a, a uh, lecture all ready to go on that uh, if, if, if we ever do lectures again. Anyway, okay. So, uh, so he's been driven the, uh, let's see here. Okay, here's my below point. Plus, uh, the, the uh, mosquito fleet has now been driven further south beyond the number point number two, and there's only this, this is the last point of defense, which is 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 Memphis and this these forts right here. So they're down in this area and they're waiting for the northern attack that's supposed to come from the north, but it turns out it's gonna the 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 uh, real attack is finally going to come from the south. Uh, Lieutenant David Porter. We'll take a look at him. Uh, while we talked about him, David Dixon Porter, uh, 13, born in 1813, he takes a look at this and he's got some ideas. He wants to eat about how we they can take New Orleans without a huge army. He uh, is, he was born in 1813. He serves with his father as a midshipman in the Mexican Navy. Uh, 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 Porter, uh, David Porter Jr., the father had been in the in the American Navy during the. 18th. War of 1812, he was on half pay and to uh, you know feed the family. He was serving in the Mexican Navy. So he takes his son with him. And at the tender age of 11 years old, this guy is now in the school of the sea. It's an 11-year-old. They're getting younger and younger. It's just a different world, okay? He's appointed midshipman of the United States Navy in 1829 when his father goes back on full pay in the Navy. Okay, so now he's maybe 16 years old. He's more the age of Reed. Okay, he gets he gets coast, he signed to the Coastal Survey and gets a good look at New Orleans. He gets promoted to lieutenant in 1841. After you know he's only been well, he's only been in the um, the U.S. Navy for 12 years at that point. But he'd been all in all, he'd been serving as a midshipman for 16 years. He gets promoted to lieutenant, and by the time of the U.S. Civil War, he's still a lieutenant. He hasn't gotten that second promotion yet. Okay, but he's got some ideas. And what he says is, look, the problem with those with, with just uh, sending a fleet up and taking New Orleans is we can't get past the forts. To get past the forts, we are going to need a huge army to envelop them and essentially reduce them by a siege artillery fire. OK, and he's got he says, look, we don't need 50,000 men. We'll put the siege mortars on that on ships and bring them up. And pound the forts with those from, from the water. And we'll do it with indirect artillery fire, which is, by that time was, was something new. What they would do is they'd, get, they'd make, while they were there, detailed maps. They would use, a, a, they'd get surveyors from the U.S. Coastal Service to do detailed maps. And they would uh, 
put these uh, these coastal mortar boats uh, in hidden places where there wasn't a direct line of sight to the fort, and they would reduce the fort uh, indirectly. Uh, they, uh, Gus Gustavus Fox, the Assistant Secretary of Navy, loves the idea. He takes Porter to see uh, uh, the Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells. Gideon Wells loves the idea. They go over to the White House, and Lincoln loves it, authorizes the attack on New Orleans. By mid-November, it's now Commander Porter. He got his, he got his promotion for the big idea. Okay, so he, he's, he's, he's given command of the mortar flotilla, which is supposed to be doing all, it will do all the dirty work. Okay, and he, he, he's given the job of creating it from scratch. And he says, they say to him, who do you want, who do you think we should get to, to uh, you know, command the backup fleet? And he recommends Captain Farragut. And let's take a look at this guy, because it's going to get worse, guys. David Glasgow Farragut, okay, born James Glasgow Farragut. Okay, he was adopted by David Porter Jr., which is David Dixon Porter's father. So this is the steps brother of Fort of David Dixon Porter. He was adopted in 1809 by David Dixon Porter Jr. when Farragut's mother dies of yellow fever while caring for David Porter Sr. So I mean, yellow fever epidemic. You know, it would never happen now, but back then it was quite uh, epidemics were quite common. He was uh, he's appointed. He's taken into a Navy family, and they immediately get him an appointment of as a midshipman at age nine. What were you doing at nine years old? Were you hanging around with sailors in officer candidate school? I think not. Okay. And it just it gets wilder. At, in 1812, he's made a prize master. At age 11, they give him the capture a ship. They give him command of it and tell him to take it back to port. 11-year-old. I wouldn't give a, I don't know if I'd let an 11-year-old get a go-kart, let alone a ship, okay? He's a prisoner of war by 1814, in 1814, at age 13, he does get promoted to lieutenant in 1822, so he only, it only takes him 13 years, okay, to become a, a, a lieutenant. He gets his first go-kart, man, he's 24, commander, you know, after that, he makes captain in 1855. And unlike Hollins, who wanted to follow his state, uh, Glasgow Farragut, who's been living in, in Virginia, uh, most David Farragut, uh, has, who's been living in Virginia most of the time, he knows what's coming, that, 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 the, that the South's going to secede. And he deliberately moves his, him and his wife to Hastings on Hudson in New York to show that he's loyal, uh, he's loyal to the Union. And Porter, the, the stepbrother, feels him out, and Farragut's all four going in. And consequently, he gets command of the fleet. Okay. So ships begin to build up here, uh, and ships and material begin to build up for the attack. Uh, here it, they build at Ship Island, which is equidistant between Mobile and New Orleans. So the, the, the fact that there's a buildup going on, you could you could still uh, screen where it's actually going to. Okay. And ships begin to arrive in mid-February. The mortar flotilla shows up on 10 March. And, and, and there's actually troops showing up by late March, 23 March. You'd think this would cause some concern amongst the Confederacy. Well, for the Army, it did. The local commander, Mansfield Lovell, which is kind of an issue, he is, he's an interesting guy. The only thing, he's a typical uh, a U.S. military academy graduate. The only interesting thing is he resigned his commission before the war, after the Mexican War, and he was serving as the deputy street commissioner in New York City at the time the war broke out. It took him a, quite a few months. He didn't actually join the Confederacy until September 1861. And he's not well loved amongst most of the Confederate sympathizers. Me, I think he did the best he could. Poor guy gets a lot of grief because uh, New Orleans is about to fall. But he, he if it hadn't been for him, I mean, there was prior to his arrival, there was really nothing there. Anyway, he sends a ship, a, a, sends a force to go recon it. They come back after four days and they say, there's, you know, 20 ships, there's all these sailors, you know, all this stuff going on. Uh, and worse yet, there's evidence the USN is staking out the channels into Lake Pontchartrain, which says to Mansfield, Lowell, Lowell, Lowell there, that, you know, New Orleans is the, uh, uh, is the target. So he goes up his chain of command to the Secretary of War, 
And after 24 hours, he's given all the authority and needs to seize ships, do all sorts of things. 13 March, okay, Davis authorizes martial law in New Orleans. So that everybody's beginning to realize the attack's coming, but from the wrong direction. Uh, the Navy, on the other hand, still kind of, uh, Commander Hollins, uh, Commodore Hollins uh, is, gets called back to New Orleans by the local commander. He assesses the situation. He says, you know, you guys are right. The, 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 the attack's coming, and it's coming from the south. And he, he recommends to the second day of Mallory that uh, the Mosquito Fleet be recalled to New Orleans. And he says, no, no. And in fact, he relieves him of command. Uh, nobody likes bad news. And they went in, apparently the Navy went into denial and said, no, 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 no. It's coming from the north. North. Well, pretty quickly, it becomes clear that that's not what's happening. Uh, within, a, within two weeks, Farragut's fleet's actually coming into the Mississippi River. It's real obvious. And the more battle-worthy units of the Mos Mosquito Fleet, including the CSS McCray, return to the New Orleans area. 15 April, 21 April, Porter's mortar fleet begins shelling. Here's the ships. We'll see the mortars here in a little bit. They're just a little, you know, it's all sail, very small. This is the Arvetta, 171 tons, uh, 93 feet long, draws seven foot of water, sails at about seven knots, 11 knots, which is relatively quick. It's fast. Okay, its armament is essentially one 13 inch mortar. Okay, they begin shooting and it works at first. The first round lands directly in the middle of Fort Jackson. And the whole idea of indirect artillery fire seems to be working. They start f firing at a rate of about 1,400 rounds a day. Okay. Unfortunately, it becomes obvious to everybody but Porter that the over time, the, the accuracy of the mortars is getting worse and worse. And as a result, okay, uh, he, uh, Porter Farragut wants to get up and into New Orleans before the Confederacy can organize an effective defense. He's ready to go. So he goes to Porter and he says, hey, uh, what, what's going on here? Is this going to work? Porter wants another couple of days. And just to make things go better, he says, let's, let's get a third party to watch this. The, a guy, uh, they have an officer climb up into a tree, another thing you do a lot in the Navy, and watch the shells fall into the around the fort. And he realizes that only maybe one out of four, one out of five of the shells is getting anywhere near the fort any longer. What had happened is, is the barrels of these guns had, had been worn out, had worn, and their firing tables weren't good anymore. Based on this, Farragut says, we're going tonight. And here's, here's, a, here's a typical picture of these, of these, uh, of these, night, uh, these um, mortar boats in action. What you see is there, here's the, like, something like the Orvetta here. It's good. The gun's huge, fires off this thing. And notice there's trees and branches up in these, 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 um, these masts. That was to sort of camouflage them so that when they were hiding behind the forests, so that they weren't in a line of sight of the fort, so the forts couldn't fire back, that they were camouflaged. Okay, in shallow water, these 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 little uh, sh uh, schooners would actually be driven into the mud every time they fired this. Here's a picture of, the, of a typical gun, uh, eighteen thousand pounds roughly. Okay, on the order of uh, of eight or nine tons of of metal there. Uh, weight of shell, two hundred pounds. Way to charge 20 pounds, maximum range about two nautical miles, uh, rate of fire about one round every 10 minutes. These things look huge, don't they? I mean, look at these people. I mean, it, things are huge. Turns out they're not very big. If you, and the reason I've shown you this is here's a little local connection. Okay, this is the Orvetta's mortar. It's exit, it's exitant. It serves as a GA GAR memorial in the center of Bristol, New Hampshire, about an hour and 30 minutes uh, north of here. And when you go, you go take a look at this thing. It's minute compared to what you think it is. But this is a nice little local piece of color here. Well, that night at three o'clock in the morning, the attack starts, uh, lots of fun action. Uh, the USS Veruna will be sunk, uh, attacked by two separate Confederate rams, but eight, uh, they, they will do quite a bit of damage to the other ships. Veruna, eight Veruna sailors, are awarded uh, medals of honor. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something to note. The CSS Manassas uh, receives the brunt of a point blank uh, broadside from the USS Pensacola, which completely demolishes the ship. 
uh, and the ship, Manassas will narrowly avoid being rammed by the USS Mississippi, piloted by little known George Dewey, okay, uh, who will eventually go on to fight at Manila Bay. The McRae, on the other hand, uh, and, and uh, uh, Lieutenant uh, uh, Reed have quite a night. Uh, they are anchored below Fort St. Philip, and the ship serves as a floating battery, was serving a floating battery, suffers a little damage at first, but eventually the, the, these larger ships begin shooting at it when they realize he's not, the ship is not a Union gunboat. And as a result, uh, she begins to take quite a bit of damage, including an 11 inch hit from an 11 inch shell, which must have just gone right through the ship, uh, sets fire and threatens the McRae's magazines. The ship's commanding officer, Lieutenant Hooger, is mortally wounded and Reed takes command. And he fights the ship for the for most of the of the of the night, and eventually he has to run the ship aground uh, under the fort to put out the fires. The next day, the sun comes up. Thirteen Union ships are are above above the forts, uh, and only one ship, one Union ship, was sunk. Three uh, there are numerous ships below the forts, and the McRae realizes the McRae is is the only ship left uh, float above the uh, Confederate Navy ships. Here's uh, the gauntlet. Uh, this is a fanciful picture. You can see here, this must be Fort St. Philip. This must be Fort uh, uh, Jackson. I, I don't think this is quite the scale, but you, you can see it. Here's the Manassas coming down, about to get the snot knocked out of it by the Pensacola. Okay. Uh, Southern, uh, you, you you, uh, Louisiana essentially falls into Union hands. Uh, the McRae will be used on the 27th under a flag of truce to take the wounded back to New Orleans. Uh, and there, uh, Mc, uh, uh, Reed will scuttle the first of many ships by cutting the steam lines and letting water into it. And by the 29th of May, 29th of April, uh, uh, New Orleans surrenders to Farragut. And Benjamin Butler's 5,000 troops come under take, take control of New Orleans. Now, it worked. They got past the forts with less than a 50,000 man army. The problem is 5,000 men are going to cause the, the lack of uh, Union troops going to cause trouble here. By the May, May 29th, they're all the way up to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So they started out here, and within a month, they're, they're moving their way up the, 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 the uh, Union Navy's move, uh, also moving down from the north, and it's it's not very good. Vicksburg is now the only thing between uh, the only thing on the river that the the Confederacy has left. Okay, uh, uh, beginning on May twelfth, uh, troops and equipment start to arrive. A lot of it from New Orleans. Uh, you know, even though uh, uh, Farragut had taken New Orleans and had his ships. Out in the river, he only had a couple hundred Marines until the, uh, uh, Butler arrived. So that the, up till the very end, the Confederacy was taking stuff out of uh, New Orleans by rail. Uh, by on the 18th of May, Farragut squadron shows up, and they found they find Smith dug in, 3,600 troops and 18 guns, and he, uh, Farragut demands the city surrender. Smith tells him to take a hike, and uh, Farragut uh, wisely realizes he's not going to do much. With with uh, he's only got less than a thousand troops, and so he, he retires southward. Okay, uh, March. What's going on up north? By this time, uh, the Confederacy, if you take a look at it, had retreated down to this area here near Corinth as a result of the original uh, fight up here at Fort Donelson and Fort Henry. Uh, they had collected all the troops they could from all these different areas to get them in front of Grant's army, which was coming down the Tennessee River. On April 6th, they launched a surprise attack on that army. Uh, they push it back, but uh, Grant fights them off. And at that night, Buell arrives. And the next day, the combined armies of Grant and Buell push what the, the Confederate army back. And that's the end of, of um, uh, uh, pretty much a lot, lot of the Confederate forces up here. It takes the Union Army another month to get from Shiloh, the area of Shiloh down to Corinth. But when they do, 
uh, the area of Memphis will fall. Okay. Now, of importance at this point in time is that there is a ship being built or ships being built in Memphis. And they're only half complete because the Confederacy was always trying uh, to build more than it could actually expect to build at the same time. They would put two ships under construction in two yards in one city and have them fight for the available resources, men and materiel. And they'd eventually end up with two half ships and not, not a whole ship when they needed it. Uh, the CSS Arkansas is an iron placement ironclad. It was a little bit further down the road to being finished uh, when things went south up in uh, Memphis and it was towed to uh, Yazoo City, M Mississippi, where it was gonna be finished up. Uh, this ship will uh, eventually, uh, I should say, uh, Lieutenant Reed is told to report to the ship as the XO. So he's gonna be, he's gonna be helping to re get this thing built and eventually fight it. Uh, 18 inches of railroad iron armor, but it's encased in wood and it's bolted on. It's not very good. Uh, ship's got an underpowered, so a 900, 900 horsepower and a seven knot speed. So it's not very slow. Okay, we don't wanna do that. Okay. So Lieutenant Raid's ordered to Yazoo City. Okay. Uh, uh, the remainder of the Mosquito fleet, uh, what's left of it is stays at uh, Memphis, Tennessee, where and Trump's is, once the army leaves, attempts to prevent the Union Navy from coming in and is destroyed at the um, at the Battle of Naval Battle of Memphis, which here's another one of these little these funny uh, uh, newspaper things. So what happens? Well, Farragut's squadron returns on the 18th June. And with the mortar boats, they're gonna this time he's got 3,000 men. Okay, unfortunately, troops. Unfortunately, by this time the Confederacy has 14,000 troops, any number of guns, and a med led by Major General Earl Van Dorn. Uh, the the four the, uh, porters mortars don't work very well here either. And by the 24th, the fleet from above New Orleans. The brown, the brown water fleet that had started out in Cairo matches up with Farragut's ships. Uh, Farragut runs past Vicksburg to, to join those ships, and they begin shooting at, uh, using the the, for, the uh, mortars to try to force people out of uh, but uh, out of Vicksburg, but with no troops, they don't really have much chance. After they've been there about three weeks. Major General Van Dorn uh, talks to the C local CSN commander and he goes into conference. They want the Arkansas with Reed on board to uh, come down and help drive away the Union fleet. Uh, Reed goes, has a conference with this guy, which is, you know, he's an 03 and he's dealing with a, with a two-star major, gen major general. Uh, it doesn't work out too well, but uh, the, he, he does a personal reconnaissance of what's there and they agree to do the best they can. Now this ship has just barely had a, it's just barely got its, its engines installed. So it's, it hasn't had a shakedown or anything, but the very next day, the Arkansas will come down the Yazoo River to attack the fleet. Now if you take a look on here, here's the Yazoo River, there's Vicksburg and there's Yazoo City. So he's gonna come down and he's, he's gonna, by his own reconnaissance, he's gonna realize he's gonna almost immediately end up in the middle of two complete Union Naval squadrons, all on his own. He comes down, he sails the ship down, not even, but the, the Arkansas sailed down, sails down, and uh, about halfway down meets a Union squadron that's coming up through three ships, it's coming up to look for them, or for the Arkansas. So all the way down from there to the Mississippi River, there's a, there's a running naval battle between the Arkansas and three ships. The Arkansas eventually goes into the Mississippi, uh, will sail right through the middle of two fleets and will anchor under uh, New Orleans uh, in a much, much, a, da a very damaged uh, situation. Arkansas CO is wounded and Lieutenant Reed assumes, assumes command of the ship. And here it is, here's the Arkansas coming down in between 
This these is a uh, as a Cairo class city class ironclad here gunboat firing and um, uh, here you've got a naval uh, an oceanic naval vessel firing on this ship. It must have been pretty harrowing. Uh, okay, concern for the safety of Porter's mortar boats and Williams support vessels because uh, the Arkansas is now between Farragut and the mortar vessels. Farragut runs back down south of Vicksburg at night. Squadron tries to shoot up the Arkansas, but you can't see anything at night. They don't do the level line of damage. On 22 July, uh, the Queen of the West and a gunboat Essex are sent down from the Northern Squadron to attack the Arkansas. Here's the Queen of the West. It's a huge, it's a, it's, it looks like a tugboat. It's heavily uh, uh, armored, I would say armored, but protected by wood. And it's got this huge bow on it that's full of wood and is, uh, be, will be used as a ram. This ship will come down with the Essex, which is a typical gunboat, uh, converted ironclad, uh, 355 tons, only draws seven feet of water, uh, four or five big guns on it. Uh, the commander of the ship is uh, Commodore, Commander Black Dick Porter, which is the, uh, the brother of, of, of uh, David Dixon Porter and uh, the, uh, the uh, foster brother of, of, of Farragut. So these two ships come down, they attack. Uh, the as the uh, Queen of the West manages to puncture the uh, the um, the hull of the uh, of the uh, of the Arkansas, and the gunboat does shoot it up, but it's still there and it's still alive and it doesn't sink. Uh, so the the uh, uh, it's kind of a draw. The fight's kind of a draw. Farragut that by the the next week concludes that with the Arkansas there and the falling water. He's got to get his ships back to New Orleans. He leaves, and uh, the uh, Northern Squadron sails up a, a, a bit ways up the north. Uh, relieved of any concerns for Vicksburg, Van Dorn will have dispatched 7,000 troops under Major General John Breckinridge, ex Vice President, to recapture Baton Rouge. Uh, there will be a fight on 5 to 6 August. Breckinridge's attack will be uh, repulsed. At the same time, the Arkansas comes down to try to uh, help with the attack. Uh, it, as he arrives at Baton Rouge, uh, Reed's ship loses all engineering power. Uh, all propulsive power runs aground on the riverbank. They can't get the ship off. And eventually, Lieutenant Reed will order the, the crew to scuttle the ship, and the Essex will come along and finish the ship off. So here you go. There's again another fanciful thing. This is now. This is uh, this is will be the the second ship that he will have, have burned. Okay, Commerce Raider. Let's go through it very quickly. Okay, essentially what happens here is on the uh, okay. Uh, on the 4th of November, 1862, with no other ship, Lieutenant Reed will join the crew of the CSS Florida. Let's take a quick look at that, uh, that ship. Here's the CSS Florida. It's a commerce raider. It was built in England, okay, under false pretenses. It was supposed to be for the Italian Navy. It essentially, uh, was, it would head for the uh, uh, Nassau, where uh, it would join up with an, a, a ship of guns. Uh, sent by a, by a second party to become a commerce raider. Okay. Now, he joins the he joins the ship, and to see how his his, his rep is as 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 changed. Uh, Lieutenant Reen joins the the crew. The CO will say, "I applied for him. He was required. He acquired a reputation for gunnery, coolness, and determination at the Battle of New Orleans. When his commander was fatally wounded, he continued to gallantly fight the ship." He seems slow, but he is sure, okay? All in all, a better review than the one he got when he was at the Naval Academy, when he was considered less than brilliant, okay? And 13 January, after he joins the ship, the, uh, the Florida slips out of Mobile Bay, and from May January through May 6th, they'll uh, travel through uh, uh, along North and South America and will uh, provide, will eventually take 12 prizes. On May 6th, Things change. 
they are off the kill. It's called Cape Sal Rogue. Okay, right here. And the ship, this Florida will capture uh, the ship called the Clarence. And this is the Clarence. It's a it's a small brig. You can't find any pictures of these actual ships. So I've gotten these line drawings here. Uh, this is a, um, a uh, uh, you see, it's got two masts. Okay, it's captured at sea. And uh, Reed will say, I propose, sir, he writes the ship's command captain, I propose to take the brig, which we have captured, and with a crew of 20 men, proceed to Hampton Roads and cut out a gunboat or steamer, as I would be in possession of the brig's papers. There can be no doubt of my passing Fort Atrocious One most successfully. And if it was impossible, you would board, if it was possible, you board a gunboat or merchant ship and would and take it or uh, would take it into uh, the Hampton Roads. If he could not possible, he fired the shipping at Baltimore. What what was this guy thinking? Well, he said he would bring the ship up into Chesapeake Bay. We said this is a period map, and would get into this area here, Fortress Monroe. It's a large fort right here on the peninsula. He'd get into the James River, find a uh, Union vessel, and cut it out. Hopefully, a gunboat, and then would bring it up to the defenses of Richmond. If he couldn't do that, he proposed to sail up the, the uh, Chesapeake Bay and come into Baltimore here and burn the the, uh, the stuff, burn ships. Okay, Captain Moffat agrees and suggests that if, if if his penetration of Chesapeake Bay is unsuccessful, he should turn north and there's a potential rendezvous with Florida around Nantucket on uh, 20 July. So he takes command of the CSS Clarence. He's got 20 men, a one 12 pounder howitzer, they find out after they uh, disappear from sight of the Florida, there's no cooking utensils on board, and there are only two barrels of half rotten salt pork to eat, which is kind of uh, sad because he's going to set course for Cape Charles. He's down here. He's, he's 3,400 miles away from here, and he's, he's traveling in about four knots. So he's got about three day, 31 days of sailing ahead of him. So. He spends that time drilling the crew in the use of the gun. They make some what are called Quaker guns by painting uh, lumber black and putting a hole at the end of it, make it look like a gun. So the ship appears more heavily armed than it actually is. And a month after he leaves, he captures his first prize, the Whistling Wind. And here you see him uh, coming up like this. Okay, he gets to this point and he captures the Whistling Wind. Okay, uh, Reed takes this ship and it's 11 men crew aboard the Clarence and burns the ship. Now you begin to see one of the problems he's gonna have. He's only got 20 men and now he's got 11 prisoners. So quickly, if he, he gets very, be very successful, he's, he's, gonna, he's gonna start having more prisoners than he does crew. So he's gotta find a way to get rid of these people. The next day, he, 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 he hails a, a, a neutral ship, the Dutch ship Argus, and pays the skipper uh, in gold to take half of the people away from it. Okay. Uh, the next day, that same day, he takes a second prize, Alfred H. Partridge. Uh, and he was going to burn that ship too, but he found, finds that it's headed for Matamoros, Mexico, which is on the Rio Grande, uh, just uh, south of Texas, with a cargo of arms. And this is par cargo was probably bound for the, for the Confederate States. So he lets them go. He bonds the prize for $5,000, which essentially is to say he signs his promissory note that six months after the war is over, he'll pay $5,000 if he doesn't burn the ship. And he lets the rest of the prisoners go. On 9 June, he's getting closer. He captures and burns the Mary Alvina and prisoners from, the, uh, from this ship's prisoners and, and prisoners from the Whistling Wind. Uh, Reed obtains information that indicates the idea of passing Fortress Monroe is foolish and is likely to fail. On June 12th, he arrives within 20, 40 miles of Fortress Monroe, and he captures Kate Stewart, Mary Schindler, and the Tacony. So let's see where he is now. Okay, he's gotten, here's June 6th. He's now getting very close to uh, He's right up here. He's getting very close to Chesapeake. He's got to figure out whether he wants to go up there or he wants to go up to Nantucket. Then he's going to decide to go up to Nantucket. Okay. Uh, so uh, 
in June 12th. He's now got over, he's 40 miles from Fortress Monroe, and he's got over 50 prisoners. Okay, so he bar- he bonds the Kate Stewart for $7,000 and places the prisoners on that ship. And he burns the Mary Schindler and the Clarence and takes over the Tacony. They might say, why would he do that? Well, it's a completely different ship than the one he's on. It's a little bigger. Okay, and what he really wants to do is hide. By now, people are beginning to learn that the Clarence is out there as a raider and that it's got two masts. So he gets himself into a three-masted ship and heads north. Okay. Uh, So, okay. Based on all information, Lieutenant Reed gives up on the idea of a raid in Hampton Roads and heads north for the projected 20 June rendezvous with the Florida. Later that day, he captures and bonds the Arabella. So what he's done is he's coming up in this direction. He captures the ship here. He's headed for the fishing grounds right off Nantucket. It takes him about a week, week, but on 20 June, he begins to capture ships. Isaac Webb and L.A. McAlber. 21, he captures Byzantium at Godspeed. 22nd, Elizabeth Ann, Florence, Marengo, Ripple, and Rufus Choate. All but the Florence, which is used, uh, he, he burns all but the Florence, which he uses to transport the prisoners. He had so many prisoners at this point in time, and the Florence was so small that the commander of the Florence, the, the, the master of the Florence, was actually worried. He had to keep people, he couldn't put all people below decks, and he knew that if he didn't get uh, to a, a port pretty quick, if there was a storm at sea, he was going to lose people overboard. Okay, the next day, uh, Reed captures the Aider and the Wanderer. And on the 24th, he captures Archer and Shatamak. The Shatamak was a large uh, transoceanic vessel. Okay, he captures it. He bonds it for $150,000. Okay, transfers all the prisoners he's now got from the last couple of days to that ship. And he transfers his command to the Archer, which... You might say, well, why is he? Look at this. It's, it's a 90-ton ship. It's a little fishing ship. Why did he do that? Well, he figured by now the Union knew what the Tacony looked like, and the Navy was out there looking for him, and he wanted to change ship. It's a, it's a form of camouflage. So he's now got a much smaller ship, and he realizes he should probably think about getting back home. Okay. And what he does, come on, I can't see. There it is. Uh, there we go. Okay, so what he does he is, is he, he burns the, the uh, archer. Okay, so now he's burned four ships, uh, four of his commands. Having given up hope on the rendezvous, he turns north. Okay, and on the 26th of June, Reed has the crew pose and, 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 um, as drunken fishermen on a frolic. He's nearing Portland, Maine, and he wants to cut a ship out from that, that harbor. He wants to get in, but he doesn't, he has no charts. He doesn't know the harbor. So he meets two, lo- the ship meets two locals, Albert T. Bibber and Albert Titcomb, both from Falmouth, Maine. And he agree, he, they're playing that they're, 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 they're just rich kids on a fishing trip. And Lieutenant Reed agrees to pay the $20 in gold to each pilot if they'll take the ship into Portland for him. And, you know, Maine or Maine or would never give up on something like this. So they go for the gold. Okay. It's, you know, it's, Today would be, you know, keep Maine green, you know, bring money. Well, this is this is this is something like that. The locals uh, from the, from these locals, Lieutenant Lee learns that the Caleb, uh, uh, revenue carrier Caleb Cushing, this large ship, is in Portland and is waiting for a new CO. Okay, he determines he wants to cut that ship out. He, the ship is actually provisioned and ready for a two-month deployment, but it's delayed in Portland due to the death of the master. They're waiting for a new captain who will show up soon. The ship is under temporary command of Lieutenant Davenport of Georgia. And this is a little, one of these little things that happens that uh, is as is, is dire consequences. Uh, he's a Southerner who stayed loyal to the Union, but this, will, this, this, this fact will cause things to go badly wrong for Reed. The archer anchors across the bay from the Caleb Cushing and awaits for nightfall. He notes that the revenue cutter appears to be minimally manned because it was. There were only five or six people on board. The rest of the crew was on liberty 
while waiting the arrival of the new CO. 1 a.m., they send a boarding party over from the Archer, and they seize the Caleb Cushing, taking a small watch team captive. Around 3 a.m., the Cushing weighs anchor and is towed out of Portland Harbor, okay, uh, trying to make as little noise as possible. Once on open water, Cushing raises sail, okay, and with the unwilling help of Bibber and Titcomb, heads for, to sea by passing north of um, I see sound. What had happened was the ship was over in this area here. They captured it. By the time they felt they could raise sail and start, uh, they were uh, start sailing. They were well north of the actual normal chip channel here. So the uh, Titcom and uh, the other uh, Mainer uh, told him he could. They couldn't go through this area. It was, it, there's too much shallow. They were going to have to go around the long way. So this is the second bad thing that happens to him. He's got to take uh, the um, He's got to take the dog leg instead of the hypotenuse here. Okay. Uh, so about 7.30 a.m., some of the Cushing sailors returned from Liberty. I, hopefully some of them were, were sober. Anyway, they note the ship is missing. And they inform Jedediah Jewett, collector of customs for the port of uh, Portland. Here's Jedediah. Okay, here, he's an uh, interesting guy. Born in 1807. Married seven uh, uh, woman, seven children, 15th mayor of, 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 of Portland. He was a collector of customs for the first half of the Civil War. Uh, he'll die on 10 October 1863 of diphtheria. In other words, another epidemic, the very kinds of things that doesn't happen anymore. Okay. Uh, anyway, Jedediah, uh, he, he suspects incorrectly that Lieutenant Davenport, who he knows is from Georgia, may have set off the CSC. CSA with the ship. Well, he's got the right. He's got the right problem. The ship is headed for the Confederate States, but the wrong guy. So he quickly raises the alarm in Portland. Jewett contracts quickly contracts for two steamers, Forest City and Chesapeake, small, uh, to pursue Cushing. He gets he gets soldiers and an ordinance from Fort Preble in the state arsenal, and in addition to the thirty soldiers he got from the Seventeenth U.S. Infantry. He had four companies of the 7th Maine and about 100 civilians to man the two ships. So the ships leave in pursuit of the Cushing. Okay, so they, they leave directly from the harbor and they take the short path. And being a steamer, they're much faster. Okay, so quickly they, they, they begin to close on uh, Reed's uh, ship, the Cushing. Uh, Reed's engineer, was what she brought along just in case they ever did get a steamship. Can't figure out how to light off the Cushing's boilers. Okay. Uh, he's got a 32 pounder cannon, which far outranges these little six pounders, but he quickly runs out of ammo in the ready ammunition locker. And when he goes to try to find the magazine, he can't. He asks Davenport, and Davenport tells him that, you know, it's for me to know and for you to find out where that is. So he, he, he quickly runs out of ammunition. And characteristically, he orders the Cushing to be burned and his crew and prisoners abandon the ship in longboats. Okay, both the longboats and the archer are quickly captured by the pursuing ships. Lieutenant Davenport is exonerated by the testimony of Bibber, Titcomb, and Cushing. And I think remarkably and quite honorably, Mr. Jewett apologizes to Lieutenant Davenport in person and in writing for ever having suspected him. So that's a, that's, that's, a, that's a decent guy there. Okay, Reed's great raid is over. During 51 day operation, he's traveled 4,000 miles and took 21 prizes. Most remarkably of all, not a single life is lost. So what happens to Reed? Oh, by the way, here's the, here's the burning of the cable pushing. There it is. Here's the, over here, you've got a, a Reed and his, and his Confederates going back to the Archer. And this must have been the, the, the prisoners that he had. And of course, here comes the steamer up to uh, cut off the archer. So that's, I love these, these pictures are great. Anyway, so Senate Reed is sent as a POW to Fort Warren in Boston Harbor. Okay, several times Reed and his fellow prisoners escaped from their cell at night only to return before morning when they failed to find a method of getting off the island. Okay, eventually the escape attempts become more elaborate. Uh, during an attempt to swim to shore to obtain boat, several of uh, Reed's fellow prisoners are drown, drown. And on one occasion, a wounded Reed 
swims to a, a sailboat only to be quickly recaptured. Here's Fort Warren. I'd use a, a, a modern map, but it's if you, it's at least got a scale on it with, with the picture. You're at least a mile and a half from any piece of land. So the thought that they were going to swim it in, in, in that cold water, I don't know. Uh, in any case, here's Fort Warren today. Okay. Uh, see, uh, it takes about a little over a year, but Reed is released in a prisoner exchange. He was returned to the CSEA and he's given command of the CSS Webb, a small ram on the on the Red River. Here's the here's this. There's the ship. Okay. On 9 April 1865, Leaf surrenders the Army of Northern Virginia, at Appomattox Courthouse. 15, 14, 15 April, assassination of Abraham Lincoln. About that time, uh, the, it, the, the, the Western CSCA, CSA is still fighting. Reed takes the web down the Red River and into the Mississippi in an attempt to escape to the Gulf of Mexico. Where he thought he was going, I'm not certain, but here's the, uh, here's the Red River. He comes down like this. He goes into the Atchafalaya, Atchafalaya to, the, to this, and then he runs past all of the old, all the old places that he remembered, Port Hudson, Baton Rouge. He sails through New Orleans. And all along the way, as he's going north, he's uh, south, he's, he's, he stops every few hours to cut all the telegraph lines so nobody can report what he's been doing. And eventually he gets almost to the river. He gets to just above Fort St. Philip and Fort Jackson. And he, um, he uh, eventually uh, runs into a U.S. Naval warship then it's too big to fight. And he does what comes natural. He orders the web burned and surrenders. So he's, he's managed to um, burn yet another ship. Reed's returned to Fort Warren and is finally released on 24 July when the war's over. So let's, let's recap. He fought in five major battles on the Mississippi River. Uh, he did the 4,000 mile raid, captured 21 uh, uh, prizes and burned five of his own ships. So that's all I've got. Um, any questions? I don't even know if I can hear anybody. Any questions? Oh, there's one chat here. Wait a minute. I'll take questions. I guess I'll, yes. Michael. Yes. Uh, that ship you were talking about in the beginning, you know, not to correct you, the pronunciation, but it's Powhatan. I grew no, up. In, you're probably right. I grew up in Virginia and I lived on Powhatan Avenue. <laughs> so just for what it's I thought right. it was an Indian name. <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah I know. He was I, part of Pocahontas and the whole thing. Yeah, this is probably where I got the Po part of it. So the Pow. <laughs> So you're, yeah. you're you're probably right. Yeah. So I don't mean to correct you. Just oh no 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 no. I I need to know that. That's a that's a good thing to know. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's certainly extensive, and uh, I you know would agree. We don't really know that much about the Western uh, campaign, about the Civil War than the uh, Southern state campaign. You know, yeah. It's we, it's it, it it gets ignored. It's 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 a bit complicated. It, it's coming from two directions, and it's it's actually where the South lost the war. Uh, I've got a lecture on uh, the Fort Henry slash Fort Donaldson campaign, mm -hmm. uh, which is um, which I think you know it, it, it's amazing that the Confederate line just falls apart after that, and they never really catch their breath. They never really get back on solid footing after that. And let's face it, uh, you know, by by uh, cutting the, the Confederacy in half and restoring, most importantly, restoring the Mississippi uh, River to for Union use, uh, it, you know, it's it saved uh, it, 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 it. It's the one thing that maybe they if they had kept the Mississippi closed, they might have had a chance of winning the war. But after that, no. Great. Any other questions? I wanted to um, just step in and say what about reed's record at uh what was it the naval academy that he yes. was yeah 
So it seems to me that some of the best generals and commanders were the worst um, students because yes. Yes. There, were, there were a couple of different commanders that I could think of that did really poorly at West Point or whatever, and yet they turned out to be pretty good generals. Book learning is no, is no guarantee of, of you know, being proficient uh, in action. You're absolutely yeah. right. This guy had a knack for uh, improvising and, and, and fighting. And, 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 and that, 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 that pushed him through. Uh, other people, you know, like Old Brains Halleck, you know, you got to name Old Brains because he had written books, but uh, the, his, his, uh, his uh, capture of Corinth, the, the taking a month to travel 20 miles, uh, probably allowed the Confederacy to uh, exist after 1862. Uh, the war, that war should have been over in the summer of 1862. Vicksburg should have been captured, uh, but but you look at it that, thanks to Old Brains Halleck, the, 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 the Northern armies are all put in one place and they, 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 they creep to Corinth, and they lose a month. Out, out in the East, you got McClellan, you know, creeping along the peninsula. And if they, if they just had had, you know, some, 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 you know, daring or, you know, you know, you know, type of general, somebody would take a little bit of a risk, that war might have been over. They, the, it's a very close thing in the, in the West. The, 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 the Union fleets act from the North and South actually combine at Vicksburg. Vicksburg, if, he, if they had brought some troops with them, they weren't all up North with, um, with Halleck, they would have, they, they, they could have taken Vicksburg. Uh, it's, it's, I, I don't know. I, just, I, I can't, I, I'm convinced that the war lasted another two years. Uh, yeah. But it was for a reason, so. Yeah. Well, you certainly are an expert. Uh, no one's going to argue that. And I wish we had um, like a week to study it. <laughs> well, did it seem that long? It, it's, <laughs> No, it might be, might have been, but it, it just is a lot of information and it's really interesting. And this is what I love about our programming, that people can go back and review this and see, um, review the, the video from start to finish or pick up where they need to take a break or whatever. But the, um, the program will be on our website and People can go back and see Dr. Schroeder's excellent work, really good research, unbelievable um, amount of information. And, and I, for one, am going to take a, a, a breeze through this again. So thank you so much, um, Dr. Right. Schroeder. I'm, and I'm glad I, I did keep it under two hours. So you did. And just I'm, barely. But. And we're, we're going to be cut off at two exactly <laughs> two hours. So if anyone, does anyone have any other questions or, um, and no. if you think of anything also, you can email me and I can certainly pass them along to Dr. Schroeder too. So, um, thank you everybody. It was, it was quite informative and very enjoyable to learn so much about this interesting guy. One more question though, really quick. Certainly. How old was he when he went in? When and where? In, into the service. He was 16 when he went to the- 16, he okay. went to so the, he was an old man. Camp. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. I mean, uh, 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 the Farragut, I think, is the worst example of that. He's nine years old when he becomes a midshipman. I mean, yeah. you know, you think, of, you, you think about sailors. Is this the kind of per person you should entrust to a bunch of- of sailors to teach him the, the, the quote unquote school of the sea. I, I don't know. It's, 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 it, it, it was a different world. It really different was. Different world. Yeah. Very much so. Well, thank you. And thank you to BCTV for putting this out there and recording it for us. Um, we really appreciate it. And we love yeah, our, thank you. our collaboration with, with you, um, Terry, with BCTV. Thank you, Dr. Schroeder. And thanks everyone for joining us tonight. All righty. Have you. a good night. Excellent.